Success in football is measured by premierships. And for most of the last century, the Collingwood Football Club has been the most successful team in the land. It boasted the greatest players, the grandest teams and the biggest support base in the country. In the days before television, in fact before moving pictures, the men of Britannia in their lace-up Guernseys would be the forerunners of the Collingwood we've grown to love. From its foundation in 1892 and its membership of the groundbreaking Victorian Football League five years later, Collingwood has aroused the most intense emotions. Its goal kickers, from Dick Lee in the very early days, right through to Gordon Nutt's Coventry and Ron Todd, achieved superstar status. Coventry was the first man to play 300 games, the first to kick 100 goals in a season, and for more than 60 years, the holder of the league goal kicking record. His brother Sid captained Collingwood to an unparalleled four premierships in a row from 1927, and won a Brownlow along the way. When you look back at Collingwood's proud past, there is a proliferation of brothers, and rightly so too, because this is a club you were born into. The Colliers, Lita and Harry, both won Brownlows, and the surviving photos do no justice to the champions they were. We can only marvel at the skills of Marcus Whelan and Des Fothergill, who won football's greatest individual honour in back-to-back -back years. Collingwood has been and will be the trendsetter in football. It is hard to imagine any man breaking Jock McHale's coaching record of 714 games over nearly half a century. That's what this club does to you. It becomes part of your life. It's impossible to do justice to the history of Collingwood in one or even a handful of videos. Footage of the pre-war days can never convey adequately the might of those teams of Coventry in the 20s or Collier in the 30s. So this is a video history of the last half century, of the magpies from Richards through to Buckley. It is the story of premiership dreams and of grand final nightmares, of great battles on and of bitter conflicts off the field, told by those who were in the midst of it. It's almost half a century since Lou Richards captained Collingwood to the 1953 flag, denying the talent-laden Geelong a rare hat-trick of premierships. Earlier in that season, they'd ended Geelong's record run of 23 consecutive wins, but for the third year in a row, finished second on the ladder to the Cats of Reg Hickey. In those days, it wasn't like it was standing around and waiting for the presentation. You were carried off by the, by the supporters. And I never forget, there was a bloke called uh, Les, he, he, was, he, he was a union steward for the wharf and uh, after the game, and we'd been through all the hoopla in the, in the dressing room, the speeches, I'd come out to go to my car and he was waiting for me. And uh, he said, I'll carry you back to your car. I said, no, I can walk back. And he got me on his shoulders and kept wanted to carry me back to his car. We'd get outside the front of the uh, Melbourne Cricket Ground, down the uh, uh, Richmond in goal, and uh, we'd get out and you wouldn't want to know. He stood on a bottle and we both went ass over turkey. And uh, I, thought, oh, I thought, that's all I know. I've just won a premise so we're going to have a broken back. But I've finished up all right. One thing I will never forget, the great Reg Hickey, the Geelong coach, 
uh, I was doing my hair and I didn't have a mirror. So he came over, he was in our rooms to congratulate us and he came over, he said, look, Rosie, I'll comb your hair for you. And he did. He was a marvellous person. Fonz Kine had taken over as coach of the Magpies in 1950 in sensational fashion after a distinguished playing career that had seen him win three Copeland trophies and lead the side for five seasons. As Jock McHale stood down after a league record 714 games and eight premierships, he was controversially replaced by seconds coach Bourbon Woods. Pandemonium followed with the club split. Kine had applied as a playing coach but had lost out to Woods. In a bitter factional quarrel, Woods would step down after three days and pave the way for one of the most successful coaching reigns at Victoria Park. We were at the meeting at the town hall, the lower town hall, and uh, they called for a division. Those four went that side, those against went that side. And anyway, all the people went that side against the committee, and uh, old Bob Rush, a terrific old fellow, treasurer of the club, said to him, um, to uh, Frank uh, Wraith, the secretary, he said, are they uh, for us? And Frank Wraith said, Bob, be buggy. He said, they're against us. And of course they were tipped out. Kine would retire and promptly take his men into the finals in his first season. In 1952, they were no match for Geelong, but in 53, with Neil Mann and Rose in superb form, won both their finals and the flag against the Cats. On the bench in that 53 grand final was a youngster who would make his mark in the decade ahead. I was only 17 years of age and I'd only played, uh, I went from third, seconds and seniors in the one year and I played four senior games. And I'd never played on the MCG and on the Thursday night Gordon Carline said, if you make the team for the grand final on Saturday, there's your ticket. And I said, well, you know, if I make it, I make it. So I, did, I didn't, hadn't played a final. I got the flu and I missed the uh, first semi-final. And then uh, you listen to 3DB in those days and the team was announced and you say, you know, you made 9th or 20th man, whatever I was. But it was, that was a big thrill, 53. Farrell Merritt shared the roving duties with Skipper Richards and Rose. I played on the great Bernie Smith and he was one of the best players that you'd ever see in league football in those times. And I had one of those delightful moments where I came from behind him and I knelt on his shoulders and took a mark and kicked a goal. Now that to me was, I never ever dreamt that I'd ever play on Bernie Smith, the great player, but to kick a goal against him and to win the premiership after that was, was tremendous. While Kine was the toast of Collingwood, the ghost of Jock McHale would not be laid to rest. Following the win over Geelong, he was asked to speak to the players. The Premiership side of 53 under Richards was laden with talent and would form the basis of a side expected to dominate the mid-50s. That year, Rose won his third straight Copeland and finished runner-up to Bill Hutchison of Essendon for the Brownlow. Neil Mann finished third, Thurl Merritt seventh. The 17-year Premiership drought had been the longest in Collingwood's history and shortly after the 53 flag, McHale and the club's greatest supporter and benefactor, John Wren, died of heart attacks. Jock McCall was my greatest, the, the greatest man I've met in football. I uh, really adored the guy. Uh, we had some little discussions uh, walking into the ground one day. He said, do you keep a scrapbook? I said, uh, oh, I have a small one that my mother kept before I came to Collingwood. And uh, he said, keep a scrapbook. And I did. And it's the greatest thing I've ever done. That I can go back over the years and, you know, find out a lot of interesting things. He dominated the AFL so strongly with premiership after premiership and final after final um, that we became imbued or uh, we couldn't get away from what Jock used to do and times were changing. And I, I found this out when I went to Wangaratta, Wangaratta Rovers, the recruiting that was done by the, the all the other AFL clubs and how hard they worked on their recruiting. Um, and I'm not criticising Gordon Carline or Jack Burns, 
um, who were Collingwood recruiting people because their hands were tied. Whether they agreed with what they were doing, they never ever said to me, but I certainly thought that we wasted a lot of years because we were tied down with the things that had been happening in, for the last 20 years. It was a new generation and we, didn't go, we hadn't gone along with it. Collingwood's first home game of the 54 season and yet another premiership pennant flew over Victoria Park. Prior to the game, the Victorian Governor, Sir Dallas Brooks, met the Magpies, led that day by acting skipper Neil Mann. They would easily account for the Lions as they prepared to win their first five games of the season. Later in the year, Collingwood fell back to earth and despite beating eventual grand finalists Footscray and Melbourne, would finish seventh. This rare footage showing the Magpies in action at Punt Road. Neil Mann in the ruck against Roy Wright, who would beat him for the Brownlow by 10 votes. Lou Richards had been a mighty stalwart of the club, a 250 game veteran who like his grandfather, Albie Panham Senior and cousin Albie had been bestowed with the greatest honour a Collingwood lad could dream of, the club captaincy. Yes, but I had a bit of an exciting uh, time before that because I was wanted to be captain two, two years before. And I was a bit of a cheeky uh, bloke on the ground. I used to even abuse my own players out there. And uh, they got crook on me, the players. And anyway, uh, I said to my brother at the uh, dinner before the first match when they elected the captain. In those days, the uh, players elected the captain. I said to my brother, you nominate me. Anyway, he said, I'll do that. And the most embarrassing thing in my life happened. He nominated me and no one seconded me. And I thought, God. And I... I woke up to myself that next year I did, did the best bit of PRing that's ever been known. I went to all the players and got the name and, and the following year I was made captain. I was captain for five years virtually and uh, captain the premiership side and I was very honoured to be captain. Plus the fact is that my grandfather, his uh, youngest son and myself being the third generation of, captain, never, of captains at Collingwood. It's never happened to any other club. A young giant had arrived from Perth. His name, Ray Gablick. And after a season playing for a local amateur side, he made his senior debut in 1955. He would become one of the greats. I was picked in the combined junior side the previous year and uh, Gordon Carline, the uh, secretary manager, asked was I interested in coming across. I said yes, I'm finishing my apprenticeship. I'm interested in coming across to play, try myself out in senior football and uh, plus get experience in my uh, work, which I was engineer. And uh, he said, well, uh, at that stage, Neil Mann is, uh, you know, getting uh, to the retirement age and we were looking for a replacement for Neil. And I said, well, you got me. Late in 55, as Collingwood again prepared for the finals, Lou Richards made a fateful decision. I'd played my 15th match at St Kilda and I'd kicked six goals and I thought I was a certain being captain playing the finals. We were going to play in the finals. We were at second top or top and... Uh, I kicked six goals and I got to Essendon. We never played well there and I didn't get a kick until about halfway through the last quarter and Des Healy passed the ball to me. I ran out to meet it, hit me on the chest and bounced about 50 yards up the ground. Then I went for a mark in the middle of the ground, hit me on the head and bounced about 90 feet in the air. And I came home and just said, we had the hotel in North Melbourne. I said to Ed, I think I'll give it away. So I came down to Collard on the Tuesday night and I said to Fonz Keim, Fonz, can I see you, Mum? He said, yes, Lee, what's the trouble? I said, Look, I said, I think I'll give it away. He said, all right, kick it over there, Charlie, will you? Righto, Fred. No, he did. I made that up. It's a better story when you do it that way, isn't it? But at any rate, uh, he said to me after the grand final, we lost it by about 13 points. He said, we should have played you and we might have won that match because I reckon I was a pretty good leader. The 1955 preliminary final between the Cats and the Magpies attracted more than 70,000 and a film crew producing a documentary about Australian football. It would feature the exploits of a young migrant lad going to the MCG and meeting his Collingwood heroes. The most loved football team in the land was the focus and the Pies didn't let them down. Wiedemann kicked three and Neil Mann starred in a two goal win. The Magpies would meet Melbourne in the 55 grand final. The three point win in round 11 at Victoria Park had been their fifth straight over the minor premiers, but they would struggle in the finals. In the grand final, Rose would be flattened by Melbourne captain Noel McMahon. It was a crucial early turning point. Perhaps it was good that I had this injury, but I missed the last six matches and uh, I went into the finals pretty much underdone and with strong words from Fonts that I was not to get involved in the heavy stuff. 
Um, and uh, I copped one in the second semi, which wasn't too severe, uh, but I didn't do it, I didn't retaliate. Um, and in the grand final, uh, another thump happened, uh, and I, uh, I, I bit my tongue and uh, didn't do a thing again. So I owe McMahon a couple. Later in the game, another sensation. We were in with a big chance with just minutes to go. Uh, Healy, uh, uh, Bluey Adams, uh, and it was an accident, there's no doubt about that. And he uh, he wiped out Des just as uh, uh, Des was kicking the ball. Um, and so if we, and we had a run on uh, and things just uh, blew up at the wrong time. In sloppy conditions, the Demons would win by 28 points. The Melbourne era was dawning, and with it the resumption of a bitter rivalry. The Collingwood list of 1956 was without Richards, reigning Copeland Trophy winner Des Healy, and sadly the man who's regarded by many as Collingwood's greatest player, Bob Rose. I was made a very nice offer for, from East Perth, uh, and then Wangaratta Rovers came in, and they were new in the Ovens of Murray League, and uh, their offer was really great. Uh, the sports store involved in Wangaratta and uh, and after what I'd been through the previous couple of years regarding injuries and being set up and that sort of thing, I uh, I decided that I would go unless Collingwood came to the party and uh, I wasn't being extravagant but they didn't want to be in it. It was another Todd, Father Gil, Fitzgerald, Healy situation and so uh, I went up there without any uh, grudges. Um, I would have loved to have played on in league footy, but uh, I had a family and my footy career was, uh, although I'd just turned 27, was, you know, getting on. Bob Rose was our greatest player at that time. No one was in a bull's roar of him. And he was only getting uh, what the, what the uh, payment was in those days, four pounds, I think. Uh, and Bob Rose was worth every bit of 20 pounds a week. And he got that going to Wangaratta as coach of the Rovers. And that's why he left. Simple as that. In round seven, the two giants of the competition met at the MCG. The Magpies led out by man on a cold, wet Saturday afternoon. Collingwood would jump Melbourne from the start, getting away to a 22-point lead at the first break. The football might not have been attractive, but this was Collingwood's best chance in their three meetings for the year. Among the standouts was Collingwood's fullback Jack Hamilton in the number eight Guernsey. Later, he would be a driving force in the creation of the national AFL competition. The pattern for 1956 would be set this day. Collingwood playing their best football in the first half and then being unable to cope with the Demons late in the game. This day, they would go down by three goals, a tragic outcome considering they'd led by eight points going into the last term and then scored a solitary behind. Again, Collingwood would finish second on the ladder to the Melbourne juggernaut. In the second semi, they'd again lead into the last quarter by a point and again failed a goal as Melbourne stormed home. As Melbourne prepared to celebrate the first Olympic Games in the Southern Hemisphere, the sides clashed for the VFL Premiership flag at the MCG. More than 115,000 packed every vantage point and spilled onto the arena to watch Melbourne win by 73 points. It was a shattering result for Kine after the near misses during the season. Television arrived with the Olympics and by 1957 the last quarter of selected matches were being beamed into households around suburban Melbourne. This is the earliest known recording. The match against South Melbourne at Victoria Park in round four of that year. Having it across the turn up. Ball on a half forward flank, Collingwood half forward flank now going down 30 yards from goal at the moment. Gray in possession. And Gray of Collingwood kicked that goal. 12 8 80 Collingwood, 8 17 65 South Melbourne. And Bergen again in possession, 20 yards out. And Brewer has it. In. And 
that was Brewer kicked that goal for Collingwood, making the scores now 13 goals, 8, 86 Collingwood to 8 goals, 17, 65 South Melbourne. He takes it right up to the centre half forward position with that kick. Ferguson knocks it from Wiedemann. And now it's Turner, uh, Bergen with the ball. And that's another goal to Collingwood, kicked by, on that occasion, Bergen. The Magpies would win this day, but finish out of the finals race in fifth position, thanks to losses against Lowly St Kilda and Fitzroy in the last three rounds. Murray Wiedemann had developed into one of the strong men on the league scene. In 1957, he won the Copeland Trophy. Melbourne had won three successive premierships, and the lure of the centenary premiership in 1958 and the chance to equal Collingwood's prized record of four straight flags looked a foregone conclusion. Collingwood had lost skipper Frank Tuck through injury. Wiedemann would take his men onto the MCG against the Demons. Deep down in my own heart, I knew we couldn't beat them. There was no hope in the world of beating them. And so you, you, went, you went out there. And I, I always had my... I used to sit in the back row when Fonce Kine got up and gave a talk about tradition of Collingwood and they would achieve our four premierships in a row. But I knew what I had to do in, uh, sitting on the back row in the dressing room there, that you knew the danger players, uh, the Mithens, Brassy, Skilton, Big Bob Johnson, those sort of players that they were match winners. And they, they had plenty of them. They, they, they could win a game in one quarter. And, uh, you know, when we came in at half-time, we were five points in front at half-time. Well, I, I was coming up the race and Fonce Kine was standing at the top of the race there and he said, Murray, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. You know, we, it was unbelievable to be in front and then, of course, we went on and won by three goals in the finish. I've never gone into a game believing that we would lose. Never ever in my life that I would go to any game. And uh, in 58, didn't make any bloody difference to me. I thought we, while we're out there, we've got a chance. They were a good side in Melbourne, but when you're out there, anything can happen and uh, it's the luck of the draw, you know, we've, uh, we've got up and won the flag. Well, they've bobbed up to win the grand final. Fenton Smith. This is Ken Turner. Been one of Collingwood's good players again today. He's had a great season. Again, a free kick in the pack to Peter Marquis. Twenty-nine minutes gone. There's the time. And the Magpies have done it. The last time was 1953. They've saved their proud record of four straight wins. Thorold Merritt and uh, Bennett, the two Rovers, who played such a great part in the win, too. Sign of delirious excitement. Look at the excitement. <laughs> well, they've broken the Melbourne hoodoo. They've kept good their record of four straight premierships. Fonce Kine is there, and they've brought, that, they've brought uh, into being the greatest football upset for many, many a long day. Murray Wiedemann, the captain in the absence of Frank Tuck, being chaired off the ground. One, two, three. Collingwood would start the 60s with another finals campaign under skipper Murray Wiedemann. Ray Gablick had put together a mighty season and would take the Copeland Trophy, but the finals would be an anti-climax. After finishing fourth, they would come from behind to defeat Essendon in the first semi-final. Centre half back, repelling another Collingwood thrust, gets it back towards the centre field area, and is that a mark? I think the umpire's played it. He has taken by uh, Gabalik again up towards half four. There's Wiedemann. Wiedemann racing into goal. Goes for the long kick. Getting it up towards the 10 metre square. And the mark is taken down there in front, directly in front by Dorman. 
Well, Dorman has a chance, I would say, to wrap the match up. He's only about 15 yards out from goal on a slight angle. And he certainly should be able to put this one through, despite the conditions. Dorman, in he comes for the kick. Fires, looks OK. I think he's put it through. He has. So that's another goal to Collingwood to take the Magpies under nine goals. 12, the margin, nine points. Next up, the big improvers of the year, Fitzroy. The slick lions of Len Smith, the masters of the flick pass. This was a miserable, wet and slushy Saturday and the conditions played right into Collingwood's hands. Despite losing Bill Sarong and Brian Dorman and trailing by eight points at the last break, Collingwood snatched one of the most thrilling finals in years by five points. And it looks all right, the crowd are going mad, there's one to apply. Look at Collingwood, look at Wiedemann waving the players down onto the ball. He's bringing fellows down there, going to smother the play right on their forward line at this stage. It's tapped out to Beers again. His kick is once again smothered. This time it's, a, it's Burns who has it. He steadies and there it is. There's the goal. That's the climax. That's the fighting climax by Collingwood. Well, that makes it very difficult for Fitzroy at this stage. And you can expect to Ron Barassi had taken over as Melbourne's on-field leader and he would take the Demons into their seventh consecutive grand final. They'd restricted the Lions to four goals in the second semi-final and on grand final day held Collingwood to two goals. At three-quarter time, Collingwood had scored twice. Melbourne, 19 times. It was a shattering and humiliating defeat. That was a humiliation. I, I felt like you know, you'd be buried in the ground if you only kicked two goals in a, on a, a wet game, on a wet day that suited Collingwood. See, that was the un, thing that you know, probably Collingwood people couldn't get used to say that here was Collingwood in their element playing on a real heavy ground and we could only manage two goals. That was a very disappointing. Of all the finals I played, that was the most disappointing. There were few bigger names in football at the time than the man known as the Weed. When he decided to move into professional wrestling on Saturday nights, the old guard at Victoria Park was shocked. They tried to get a name. They went and say, saw Ron Barassi, uh, uh, Ray Gabley, uh, Neil Roberts or so-and-so, and none of them were prepared to have a go at it. And they come and saw me and said, would you have a go at wrestling? And I said, yes, I'd have a go at it because we're only getting £10 a game for footy, and they, I said, well, what's in it? And they said, well, we can't promise you any financial money, but we, you wrestle for 10% of the gate. If we drew a good crowd, you get 10% of the gate. So on the first Saturday night, there was 10,000 people at the stadium. I was tag partnering with Sal Savaldi. He wrestled George Bylas, the Zebra Kid, and uh, Paul Vachon. And, of course, you know, always, uh, the goodies always uh, lose, and the baddies always win. And it, it was great. I had 10 pro wrestles, Sydney, Melbourne, and uh, financially I did all right out of it. While Murray the Mat Man continued at Festival Hall on Saturday night, things had reached crisis point at board level. The committee of Sid Coventry was being challenged by the Galbalies. Prominent lawyer Frank had openly suggested that Coventry, the great captain of the famous four premierships, stand down. Frank's brother John, like him a former player, would stand as president. Into the fray would step Tom Sherron, whose family name was emblazoned across the footies kicked out on the park. It would be Galbally the lawyer, the leader of the Victorian opposition, the orator, against Sherron, the working class man steeped in Collingwood tradition. While coach Fonskine opted for the Galbally faction, Wiedemann rallied the players behind Sherron. They saw this as the chance to have Kine replaced by Bob Rose. Ron, you must be very disappointed to see this scene here at Collingwood today. Oh, a little bit, Ron, but still I suppose they're entitled to their own opinion and their opinion is such, so well, I can't do much about it now. Uh, do you feel a little bit un uneasy about the coming season, regardless of the result of the election, uh, in view of the way the, the, the players are, are divided at the moment, or the players well, divided, but know. the division between yourself and the players? Well, there's a few here. Of course, I suppose if we had the other players here, they might be with Fons Kine and Neil Mann, but uh, at the moment there's only half a dozen of players, but uh, there are leading players. The players, we had a meeting this morning and we all decided that we would like to see Mr Sheeran as president of this club and uh, we are fully behind him. Sheeran's ticket would win the day, gaining 60% of the vote. While Kine remained as coach, he was on non-speaking terms with his captain. The position was intolerable through 1963, the club won one of its first four matches and seven of its last eight 
to finish in eighth position. New blood was emerging. The club had fought successfully to lure future grand final captain Terry Waters from VFA club Dandenong. When I came down here to train with the club, uh, uh, it was on the condition, uh, according to my mother, that I wasn't allowed to sign with the club. But uh, Collingwood's uh, tradition in those days was such that uh, after I'd spent a few hours here, uh, Dad said to Gordon Carline, where's that thing that Terry has to sign? You know, and it really was. A young man from Ballarat named Des Tuddenham won the Copeland Trophy and showed the leadership skills and toughness that would mark him as a future great. I grew from as a kid. You know, I used to run down my, on the farm and kick the footballs. I was probably raised. I was sole merit and all that stuff, you know. So Collingwood to me was very special. Murray Wiedemann's tenure as the Collingwood enforcer came to an end. A triple Copeland Trophy winner, 180 games, four years as captain. And back to the club came Bob Rose to take over from Kine. We'd said it was a financial argument uh, why he didn't come back and play, but I remember a discussion he and I had, and uh, uh, it was about discipline on and off the field, uh, particularly off the field. Uh, we didn't agree, so he didn't play. The rise would be instantaneous. In an even season, the Pies would finish second on the ladder behind bitter rivals Melbourne. They would play Norm Smith's Demons once during the season and lose by 10 points. On second semi-final day, the margin would be 89 points. Hardly the build-up to one of the most thrilling grand finals of all time. This was a game remembered for a couple of individual highlights and one of the most heart-stopping finishes in football history. Herbert and Davis clash, they might be hurt. Picked up by Graham, his hand pass is misdirected, but luckily goes out to Waters. He's run down by Rowan, who upsets his kick. The ball has gone to the centre wing. Compton jumps onto the ball. Tubman frantically kicks it forward to Gabba, who's 30 yards out his own. The big 17 stone calling the captain goes for a run. Takes it to the goal, on his own. It's a goal! And then with that run, I don't know what went through my mind. I knew. You know, Jack Dyer, Lou Richards say, are you running the right way and all that uh, baloney. I knew which way I was going. I wanted to put me side in front. In the end, the man who stole the match was an unlikely hero, a back pocket player named Neil Crompton, who would kick his only goal of the season. The Melbourne team for many years has played well today. On the half forward line, he sends it forward. Up they go, Barassi in there, can't pull the mark down, taken by Neil Compton, Compton kicks in towards goal for Melbourne. A goal to equal Gavalich's performance and the stadium's gone crazy. We lost by four points and I mean just when you get to that stage it was a matter of luck and Compton snuck down from the back pocket and kicked a goal. Uh, today that wouldn't be unusual for a back man to do it, but then it was very unusual. Um, I, I think that was certainly the gutsiest side that I coached. Two brilliant new recruits would be introduced to Collingwood in 1965. The first would become one of the great goal kickers in the tradition of Gordon Coventry, Dick Lee and Ron Todd. The other would be a shock inclusion for the preliminary final. Peter McKenna and Len Thompson were two players around which Rose could build a power side in the decade ahead. Then to come down here and play for the club and play with legends, Ray Gabalik and Des Tuddenham and Kevin Rose and all these guys that have been around for a long, long time. Johnny Henderson was captain in those days, Ken Turner, these sort of guys. And just the being part of all that was just so exciting because I came down here to play in the thirds and then went straight into the first, which was a big thrill and unexpected at the time. And uh, it was a big thrill for a naive kid from West Heidelberg. I have watched over the years Crackers keen and scratching the ground and all that like a pretender. The bloke that invented it, Don McKenzie, who was an absolute all-time lunatic over the white line, but off the ground, a delightful man. Really lovely man, Don McKenzie, but over the white line. Whew. And then Duncan Wright and John Somerville incident about eight minutes into the game. And uh, I thought to myself, well, I cannot believe this. You know, I've just turned 18 about a week before. And, he, and this bloke said, go near the ball, son, and I will kill you. 
I believed him. After the frustration of 1964, the Magpies would again finish second in 65, this time behind the new glamour team of the competition, St Kilda. Rose would watch his boys lose the second semi-final to the Saints by a point, setting the stage for a preliminary final showdown against Essendon and one of the great controversies of the decade. Hello. There's a player out on the ground. Somerville has just collapsed. Ten minutes into the first quarter, the record crowd of 95,000 saw Essendon forward John Somerville lying unconscious. Nearby, Collingwood's Duncan Wright, hands on hips. Wright denied wrongdoing, but the incident would destroy the confidence of the Magpies, incite furious and vocal opposition from Essendon supporters, and would be the end of the tough defender's VFL career. The 55-point loss was a tragic end to the season. In 1966, Collingwood added Wayne Richardson and Barry Price to its senior list. They would be two magnificent and highly talented on ballers who would team superbly with McKenna in front of goal. Gablick had handed the captaincy over to John Henderson as injuries hindered his preparation and in 1966, Tuddenham would accept the key role. Collingwood would finish on top of the ladder for the first time since 1930 and with Tuddenham kicking seven goals against St Kilda in the second semi-final, marched straight into the most talked about grand final of post-war years. It's the atmosphere for a heart attack, the ball is into the goal square, Tuddenham tries to bust his way through, he'll pick it up, he scores! Fabulous! Five goals to Des Tuddenham. Bill Ashworth, Dennis Rawadi under Ron Davis's direction at the MCG, a classic finals match. Channel 9 in the centre as Kevin Rose gives it to Boyne. Boyne on the move from the back line, it's into attack this kick. The Magpies three points down, it's towards Big Gabba. Sinman runs him down, the hand pass has gone to Tuttenham. Tuttenham sixth attempt, coming up for a goal. Six to Tuddy. Smith, opposing Rover, takes the kick from the back pocket along the Olympic stand wing. No mark here, it stands right for uh, Kevin Rose. Kevin Rose, a strong, long kick going in towards the goal square again. Three Saints there, they fumbled it. Alan Morrow, it's up to him, he's grabbed by Wallace. Wallace tries to take the ball off him and very nearly did so. Tuttenham just about to run out of space, has a kick and it's his seventh! Everything's in the role for Rose, Taylor Griffiths and uh, I kicked two goals. One was I turned on the boundary and put my hand on it and kicked the goal and... It was just sensational, you know, to be able to uh, play a game like that, get the club into the grand final, being captain. It was just, yeah, one of my days I always treasure very much. The grand final attracted massive publicity. St Kilda still dreaming of its first flag. Collingwood hoping to reverse the horrors of 64 and 65. There would be no more than a kick in it at any change. This was a genuine heart stopper. The hand will stop shaking, I can see the watch. 27 and a half minutes. 27 and a half minutes, there's the kick out, up they go, over down to the break clear, across it goes here towards Hill, Hill tries a hand pass to Henderson, he's tackled by Morrow, and we find the ball being driven forward, it's a ten and a half forward for St Kilda, why not? not, he'll be paid the mark, slow it down, slow it down. Uh, Peter Boyne kicked to me, and I went one bounce, one bounce, I get one more bounce, either score or kick a goal, you know, and I saw... There was Gabbo in there and um, there was, um, uh, Dalton was there and uh, Ian Graham. The three there and, and here's Bob Murray sitting in the middle of them. I said, I just kicked the ball right in there, you know, someone's going to make it because Bob Murray marked it. It's a goal, Tottenham, a break. Tottenham kicks to centre half forward. They set themselves and a mark to Bob Murray. A mark to Murray. 28 and a half minutes gone. Hit the boundary line. 28 and a half gone. There's Murray's kick to the wing position on the outer side. There's the siren. St. Kilda got it. They got it. Look at this. Alan Jeans uh, and I are, are very good mates and have been for a long time. Uh, and he, uh, every time we meet, he says, uh, I'm a much better coach than you, Rosie. <laughs> the joke is he won by a point and, you know, it could go either way. Carlton and Collingwood had always been bitter rivals. In the late 60s, that rivalry was white hot. Quirk can't get it. 
Tully pushing it, shoving oh. down. Oh, it went down very heavily from Tottenham again. He's been allowed to take the mark. He plays on with the left foot now. Girl waiting from behind. Oh, and he stops one in the face. And he... Have a look at this for a little bit of a ruckus. Tottenham kicks the ball up the centre half forward. The players collide. Hopkins was one picked up by Nichols. Nichols now sockets the ball off the ground. Tottenham does one in the... <laughs> and, and, and the whistle goes. The whistle goes. There'll be a free kick here to Tottenham. Oh! <laughs> oh, are they going in? Rough and tumble out there, I'll tell you. They're going down like nine pins. There's only about six more fellas to get there, and the entire two sides will be there. Shades of last year, Jack at Princess Park. Off the field, the revolt was fermenting. Tom Sherrin had authorised a $5,000 signing on fee to blonde West Australian star Peter Eakins. The 1969 Tassie medalist was coming to Victoria Park. Suddenly, the club received letters from lawyers representing Tuddenham and Thompson. Tuddy wanted $18,000 over three years, Tomo much the same. Both claims would attract massive headlines. The reason that we stood a little bit firm, and I believe it was... Uh, was only fair that we did so, was that, for instance, we had uh, Peter Eakins that come from Western Australia. Connie, we weren't prepared to pay us any more money. We were training hard, and Tomo and players like that that were very dedicated to football, and uh, we didn't get any inducements at all. And he got $5,000 to come, so we were just, I believe, fair game to ask for a little bit more. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, rally and give us anything. And that's when they disposed me as captain because I was outspoken on the terms which I believe were fair right. terms. I wanted uh, $4,000 a year for five years. 22 to 27 puts you in a pretty good you know, spectrum of your career. Tuddy was probably 25. He wanted 6000 a year for three years. So, like, that's chicken feed. The club would not accede to the request of the captain and star Ruckman they were out of football. Tuddenham was stripped of the captaincy. That would go to Terry Waters. The Rebel pair would, however, return to the side in time for the first game against Footscray. McKenna signalled his intent with 11 goals in a 64-point win. The interesting thing is, though, that despite the fact that all those things were happening off the field, on the field, I don't think you get a tight and neat bunch of blokes. A week later, it was the reigning Premier's Richmond, youngster John Greening in great form. Down at half-time, the Magpies rallied to the delight of the Vic Park faithful. And there's still a hard bot or two on the oval. Michael Green once again has dueled down to what? What a lightning hand pass into open territory. Chance for Cloak. Cloak has got the... No, he hasn't. I thought he had the free kick. Picked up by Thompson. Thompson across to Dunn. Dunn's in trouble. Cleverly across to Wayne Richardson. Wayne Richardson shoots for goal. And nothing succeeds like success. It's another goal. And the kids try to swarm on again. The police, too, have uh, taken quicker action on this occasion. Three goals Wayne for that Richardson. player, Wayne Richardson. McKenna would have one of the great seasons in league history. Against Carlton at Waverley, he'd kick eight as the Magpies came from 20 points down at three-quarter time to win their eighth straight game by 23 points. Richardson playing on into the forward pocket and he's pushing and shoving going on there and it's a kick to McKenna. Play on there calls on Parat, so it'll, it'll be a free kick downfield and he's put it through. This was a team with resolve and after the winning streak had ended against Essendon they came back with a stirring and famous win over St Kilda. At half time they'd trail by 52 points. Richardson who has kicked two in this final quarter. He is on an angle all right. But he's only 25 yards out. All pressure on him now. Here it goes. A drop punt. The result. Collingwood in front. It's desperate football. Players from the Tottenham racing towards that half forward They get a free kick to Tottenham. Free kick to Tottenham. Tottenham's free. He's well within kicking distance, but at this late stage of the day, He's got to score at least a point. It's short. And a oh, Wayne Richardson. Oh, a great 
great little player and a grand mark. Oh, he out maneuvered them all. 27 and a half minutes gone. Wayne Richardson, 20 yards out, directly in front. He's only 15 yards out. There's some argument going on. Murray's saying he's minding McKenna, not interfering with Richardson. Up comes Wayne Richardson. Collingwood back in front. Never have I seen a more exciting match or an exciting finish in my whole career, and I'm not exaggerating one bit. In their worst performance at Victoria Park since the turn of the century, Carlton could manage only two goals in round 19, a day made famous and memorable by Peter McKenna. Said be 60 yards out, directly in front, kicking to the river end. There's 99. There he goes. The price is going to uh, do the sensible thing. He kicks it high into the goal square. They fly down to the ground. It comes. Kick off the ground here by McKenna. And he's good. He's it. But the goal will be the best. Well, look, they did everything. Well, have a look at this. Well, the memories was it was so exciting because we thrashed Carlton down at, at, at uh, Victoria Park. Um, I kicked it late in the game. The crowd rushed on the ground, and then straight away Bobby Ray's took me off with five minutes in the game to go, and I didn't want to go off because naturally you're in. We'd beaten Carlton three times that year, and I wanted to be part of the action right to the end. But Rosie, in his wisdom, said, "Right, you're off," and I couldn't believe it when the runner came out. But very, very exciting, and um, it was a big thrill, and all the crowd rushing on the ground, it's memories you never forget. Collingwood would top the table for the third time in five years under Bobby Rose. The teams would meet again in the second semi-final. McKenna, the dominant man on the field. He'd kick 9-5 from 16 kicks and 10 marks. Dunn couldn't mark it. McKenna's got the ball. He steadies. He hooks it around. He's got a through. Dunn is in there. Dunn knocks the ball away for Collingwood. It's taken by Greening. Greening kicks forward. The ball bounces awkwardly. A chance here for Wayne Richardson. He hooks it around. It's over McKenna's head. No mark over Thompson's there. McKenna off the ground. We certainly had the players up in front of him who knew how to deliver the ball. And uh, uh, But Peter was a great player. I, I think he was underestimated. You know, he, he stood up to the vigours of the Wes Lofts and the fullbacks who were pretty rough and tough. Uh, he never ever complained, he never whinged, he didn't fight back, he didn't punch back. Some people have had the stupidity to say to me that they thought he was a bit soft. He just took them and kept on kicking goals. Four points down at the last change, the Magpies rallied yet again to win by ten points. Bob Rose still has nightmares over the 1970 grand final, the day Collingwood led at half-time by 44 points in front of a record crowd of 121,696 fans. McKenna had started brilliantly with six goals. His tally of 143 was a new club record. Well, I went for a mark uh, just before half time and Tuddy, I think Tuddy tried to iron out Kevin Hall who was playing on me and missed and knocked me out instead. So I had concussion, I can't even remember the second half of the game. Magpie fans don't need to be reminded of the fateful second half. A blonde flash named Hopkins kicked four. Barassi inspired his men to handball and the Blues stole the game by 10 points. Nichols, a long hand pass towards Gallagher, but through they come, oh, Callaghan is there, Jackson picks up for Carlton, Jackson the left foot stop. Darlingwood, bowl them over, fly higher than we can, black and white, wear it over. Despite the heartache of 1970, the Magpies opened the next season in blistering fashion and were unbeaten after seven rounds. Good football, here comes uh, Greening with a long e dummies. He's got a shot. There's a chance for a goal. He'll be missed solid. And he fires, and it's a goal. McKenna was the hottest footy property around. He was kicking plenty of goals, in fact, four times bagged double figures, was a superstar in football mad Melbourne, and was on his way to another century of goals. Right on the moment by Tuttle, who hands it out cleverly to Price. Price on his left foot, it's an hour forward, drives it all forward. Up goes McKenna, and McKenna marks. And 
there was Henry Coles of Collingwood. Puts it over the center ball position and McKenna will have some goal. Takes a mark. He's not that far out that he can't kick it. He's only about 40 yards out. Price coming through much more. A good hand pass over to McKenna. McKenna right in front of goals. Couldn't miss it and doesn't do so. He's at the Price now. Price looking for a teammate in McKenna and finds him on this occasion. Well away. It's a goal as the siren sounds for the end of the third quarter, and that's McKenna's eighth and Collingwood's 15th goal on the board. But it's the Collingwood Rovers capitalising on it. Wayne Richardson comes out, gets it to Tubman. Tubman back to Richardson. Beautiful football, great understanding. Down towards a mighty Peter McKenna. <laughs> it's only about 30 yards out directly in front, and there is number eight. When you first start in AFL football and you're young, I think you get a bit carried away with your self importance, but I was, Collingwood supporters were very, very good to me uh, in my time. I suppose I was playing in a glamour position, playing at full forward and kicking goals and I won a couple of uh, popular player competitions because of Collingwood supporters and Collingwood supporters were very loyal to me, they were fantastic. There they come, the kids are coming on the ground now. McKenna has kicked his 100th goal. The Magpies would fall off in the latter half of the season, finish fourth and bowed out to Richmond in the first semi. For Rose, this was it. The champion player had left in his prime. As a coach, he could do nothing more. Bob's record was probably eight years as coach, got the side top five or six times, hasn't got his flag to show and every one of them were in a position to win the flag. So yeah, yeah, tragic stuff. There could be no other replacement than Neil Mann, for 15 years the loyal and long-suffering deputy. Mann was the obvious choice to help reunite the club, despite calls in many areas for the appointment of the fiery Tuddenham as playing coach. Rose was snapped up by Footscray, Tuddy left for Essendon, where he would breathe fire into the Bombers. In round four, the brilliant John Greening was knocked unconscious by St Jimmy O'Day, 70 metres behind play. He would not play again for two years. O'Day was suspended for 10 matches. McKenna would again be brilliant for the third year in a row he topped the century. He even released a record. Under Man, the club would finish third in 1972 and then, in another September blowout, lose to Richmond and then St Kilda. If there was a bright note, it was the sensational form of Ruckman Len Thompson. The best and most mobile big man in the game won his third Copeland Trophy and the Brownlow Medal as well. To the fairest and best for 1972, Mr. Len Thompson of Collingwood. <laughs> the 10 year rule came into effect in 1973. Tomo asked for more money to stay. Mann took Collingwood into top spot on the ladder. Thompson was again the best big man around and won his fourth Copeland Trophy. McKenna would fall short of his century, finishing with 88 goals. They would win 14 of their first 15 games, 19 of 22. After losing to Carlton in the second semi-final, the Magpies dropped McKenna and Price for the preliminary final against Richmond and included a 16-year-old, Rene Kink, for his first game. We'd played Carlton in the second semi at Waverley and I woke up on the Saturday morning shivering. I couldn't believe it. I said to Marita, my wife, well, listen, I think I might be a bit nervous or something, I'm shivering. And, uh, and she said, well, you must be crook. Well, as it turned out, I had the flu. I came up with the flu and I played, my legs felt like jelly. 
I was told during the week to save my energy for the next week. The paper came out on the Friday morning, out McKenna ill, after I was told I was in the side. Preliminary final against Richmond, a club that I always played well against. Well, to be quite honest, at that particular time, I was quite prepared to leave the club. Uh, and I, I really believed I was up to the task, and I went out there with a real positive attitude, and unfortunately got beaten, but uh, that's football. 16-minute mark, rather, in the first quarter. There's Dick Clay kicking out, goes straight up the centre. Law is kicked by Clay into the centre, it's punched forward, it goes towards Max Richardson, who brilliantly gets it to Thompson. Thompson straight down the centre, the Scott's kick, it's a beauty, right to the edge of the goal square, they set themselves, Jenkins goes up a mile, here's a go now for a kick, kick in a bit of trouble, hooks it over, this is close, it's very close, it's three, that's his second, to the edge of the goal square, big herds in there, plenty of big timber, in comes Atkinson, Atkinson hooks it over his shoulder, we're mouth now, goes to the edge of the goal square, the players fly it to that, Kink is marked. The kid, the 16-year-old schoolboy from Mount Dead set pressure goal. 20 metres out, he kicks. And it's through. The Magpies were rebuilding. Among the recruits in 1974 would be future captains Peter Moore and Ray Shaw, and a huge crowd favourite for 10 seasons in Billy Picken. Well, even as a kid, I wanted to play with Collingwood. Uh, secondly, to row the Lynn Thompson. Third, to captain the side. And most importantly, fourthly, to uh, win, uh, win the Premiership. It would be the end of the Sharon presidency. To the club would come a man called Ernie Clark. He demanded that tradition be pushed aside, that the old photos be taken from the walls, and a new tradition be created. To become a part of this family, and we're all very lucky to be given that privilege to be part of the Collingwood family. And Clark wasn't a, a part of that a family, he was an outsider and deserves to be criticised for it. I remember it very vividly, it was a very low ebb uh, because there was so much dissension in the club, no one was happy, Ernie Clark was like a tyrant that came in with a, with a strong stick to sort of smack everybody on the backside and uh, it just, football wasn't ready for it unfortunately. Before Sharon departed, he'd lured Murray Wiedemann back from Adelaide to replace Neil Mann as coach. The traditionalist Wiedemann and the free-thinking Clark would prove a volatile mix. Ern got in and tried to shake the club up and uh, to get it out of its lethargy because it's 1958 since they'd won a premiership and they won 53, so it was a long time. And he tried, it could be said, he tried to do too much too quickly. The Weed would bring with him a man who would become known almost on arrival as fabulous Phil Carmen, a charismatic and brilliant footballer from Norwood. Carmen was a magnificent addition. He passes, oh, it's a beautiful pass. He's looking for Carmen again. They're going a bit Carmen crazy. He's got the mark. Oh, Carmen was a great player. Uh, I don't think we saw the best of Carmen. He broke his foot against the, in the state game there. He hadn't played for some eight, nine weeks, and we played against the Kilton. He kicked ten goals. He said, just play me full forward. Oh, he was a brilliant player, Carmen. He's not one of the greats I've seen, because I've seen better players of Coleman and uh, Polly Palmer, EJ Whitten, and I've seen better players. But he, he, he was a good player. Down we throw in taking place. Moore using a bit of weight against Jones, but Jones had the effective ruck work working for him. Shaw tried to get around Dewar, put the ball down, holding the man decision, I'd say. Bit of rough and tumble here. Pun kick in the ward, the forward pocket. Now he's coming back into the square. Thompson pushed out. Galt missed an easy mark. Rear mouth hand passes the pocket down to Anderson. One bounce and quite a long kick. In the back is Carmen. Mark the ball. And Carmen has given the mark. Over the back of Barker, who's played a very good game, Barker, but Carmen has been one of the mainsprings in the return of Collingwood after uh, halfway through the second quarter. Carmen getting the rounds of the whole crowd as he goes in to kick. The kicks looking look good at the finish. It is. With Clark and Wiedemann openly hostile, the Magpies went down in the first final against Richmond, albeit by four points. I was disappointed in the second year. There's no doubt about that. But I, I lost interest. The players lost interest. There was nothing. I, I was belting my head against a brick wall. 
Clark wanted Des Tuddenham back at the club in 1976, but Wiedemann felt he would be waiting in the wings to take his job. And while he resisted the move, the president won out. I came back because I loved Collingwood. It was part of Collingwood. Cap come back and be captain of Collingwood. It was just terrific, but um, I loved Murray. But Murray, had, Murray didn't have any discipline at all. Uh, the club was just, you know, it was just kick and giggle stuff. Tuddenham replaced the highly popular Wayne Richardson as captain seven seasons after being stripped of the honour. McKenna had left two after a kidney injury. He'd kicked 838 goals. He wanted to play on, but had to go elsewhere. The opening weeks of the season saw the row between president and coach hit the headlines on a daily basis. In the end, as Clark became more of an influence on team selection, Wiedemann issued the ultimatum. Either he goes or I go. Did you have any indication up until this morning that uh, Wiedemann was going to make this statement? None whatsoever. You were friendly with him on Saturday, I presume? Well, we were. <laughs> there was no dispute or argument. I was talking to him on Saturday evening. And uh, you have called a special committee meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. Will that uh, committee meeting discuss uh, Wiedemann's future? Uh, we'll discuss all aspects of the uh, current situation, yes. Would it be right to say that that committee meeting could easily sack uh, Wiedemann? Well, that will be up to the general committee to make a decision in that area. Everyone had become involved. The Richardson brothers had been dropped to the reserves. The club was at breaking point. I think that they would probably uh, have to fire Murray at this stage for, the, for their statements in the press. What would be the attitude of the players to that? Oh, I think Murray would have full support of the players, Jack. I'm very sure of that. Would you see a, a sort of a, a mutiny by players if that happened? Well, I think the players would have something to say, put it that way. Yeah. No coach can work without the full cooperation of the president and committee. The successful clubs have done this uh, very well, and uh, in the past, Collingwood have always had a wonderful understanding from the president to the coach, and uh, this is a must, Jack, and if there's trouble there, well, something's got to be done. On May the 23rd, Clark resigned. He did so with some dignity, and just as it appeared that Thurold Merritt would take the top job, he declined and it would fall on the shoulders of John Hickey. Des Tuddenham was 33, but still capable of handing it out. Against Carlton, his forearm buckled as it made contact with the head of Carlton's Mark McClure. The end was nigh. The mid-70s were the low light of Collingwood century in many minds, and 1976 saw the club slump to last on the ladder and become wooden spooners for the first time. To finish last was a, a really hard thing to, to cope with. When you look back on it though, we, uh, we only lost, well, we lost six games, I think, uh, under a goal. Um, we won six to be wooden spooners, which I think is the, the most any club has, has won to be wooden spooners. But um, yeah, it was very tough and uh, to finish wooden spooners for the first time ever, uh, to be a part of that club was very tough. Wiedemann had warned the club that he would not seek the third year of his contract and for the first time the Magpies looked outside their own nest. Tuddenham had been considered, 1953 Premiership hero Ron Richards was a contender, but when Richmond dumped Tommy Hafey, he was the logical choice. In 1977, Collingwood under the four-time Richmond Premiership coach Hafey would do what no other side had done in league history. They roared from bottom of the ladder to the very top. I think, think a lot of people don't realise that the mental preparation and the mental build-up is probably even more important than the physical build-up. And, uh, you know, this is probably the area which is the difference between the top and the uh, ordinary side. Uh, coming through for Collingwood pretty solidly was Barham, and he's been burning on the wing so far this quarter and showing his uh, horse of a pun of a clean pair of heels. Playing very badly at the moment. As a Along the way, they introduced a young speedster named Ricky Barham, who would play more well, than 150 the games. Accepting the ball, Barham racing in for Collingwood. He's going to kick his third, is he? Yes! Goes through, punches the ball through the legs of Polkinghorne. Uh, Barham there, cops run for his corner. Put through Manessa, uh, which lands the ball just over the centre of the ground. Hendry in the van for Hawthorne sees Peter Knight tap it forward, but it goes to Cooper, and Cooper shoots a hand pass out to the wing. Collingwood, they've been doing this all day. They look good when they do it too. And this is Barham. He's kicked about four goals for Collingwood, a very impressive player. How far can he go? He's gone about a mile, and look at the kick. Fantastic! 
Five goals to Barham. Great play by the Magpies. And he gets congratulations from skipper Max Richardson. Ah, oh, tremendous effort. 1962 Hawthorne, Collingwood, 18 8, 116. Great play. In the second semi final, the Magpies would win a thriller against Hawthorne by two points. It was one of the matches of the season, but it would come at a terrible cost. Carmen was reported for striking Hawthorne's Michael Tuck. He would be suspended for two matches. This would be the first time the VFL Grand Final was telecast live into Melbourne. It was a guaranteed sellout. The ruse of Barassi against the Magpies of Hafey. It was the battle of the game's super coaches. No matter how hopeless, no matter how far, to be willing to fight without question or cause, to be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. This glorious quest that my heart lights when Collingwood would struggle to cover the loss of Carmen. They would look to blonde ruckman Peter Moore up forward. Thompson, the veteran, was on his way to a record fifth Copeland Trophy. He would confront and beat Peter Crackers Keenan. And the solid Magro would arguably be his side's best. By three-quarter time, Collingwood led by 27 points. Should play on the hurry. He's taking too much time. Now the short pass goes to Wearmouth. He'll play on the hurry. Loves a run and off he goes. Shocking old scrubby kick though. Oh, beats them all. Ran towards four foot. Government misses it. Can't stay on the goal square. One a kick and he's put it through. Maybe that was a problem because I remember the hype at three-quarter time uh, and that was probably one of the problems once again, not only the hype before the game but hype at three-quarter time, committee or people maybe that shouldn't have been on the ground walking around saying, yeah, we've got them, let's go, let's go and, and I think it was, it was too much of a self-belief. I can remember I was talking to some player and I looked around and all the staff, the trainers, the committee and everybody were jumping up and patting fellas on the back as though we'd already had it one and all of a sudden I've had to yell out, you know, more or less, the game's still got 30 minutes to go. And scores North Melbourne a goal in front. The kick by Picken is into the goal square. There's a mark here to someone. It's in front of Twiggy Dunn. It's a, it's a Twiggy Dunn, I think, has got it. Oh, oh, golly, it could be a drawn game. Well, oh, the pressure on this veteran from Collingwood played over 200 games. Fires for the goals. And he's put it through and scores it. And he gets so close and not win it. And then now uh, you've got to go through all that again. Yeah, yeah well, I was angry about it. Picked up by a little ball. He's going for one. Can he get it down there on There's the side of the neck for the end of the game. It's a draw. It's a draw. We started Sunday morning and trained very hard for that uh, the whole week. We trained four nights of that uh, that week where I spoke to Barassi after the, um, the grand final. And um, they trained, I think, for 40 minutes on Thursday night. So we were a little bit, uh, in my, my opinion, overtrained for the replay of the grand final. A week later, on October the 1st, the replay took place in front of 98,000, Collingwood seeking its first flag in 19 years. This time, it would be north at every change, and despite some magnificent solo performances, the Magpies struggled. Flight take it, Renee King can't first clear, flight's there. Also, Magro for Collingwood, Gordon, trying to get it out, which he does towards Manassar. Vanessa to drive, Collingwood Demon to take goes for a run. Almost towards the half four nine. He is now. He's run 50 metres. Goes to the handball. No pains the handball. He won't give in Manessa. He's going to shoot for goal. And he's put it through. He's put it through. Great goal. What an individual effort. Max Richardson would be one who would pay for the loss. He was stripped of the captaincy. That would go to Len Thompson. The Magpies would lose seven games in 1978, North beating them in both home and away fixtures. Carmen was on the way out. He would have one last hurrah in the finals in a losing qualifying side against Hawthorne. A week later, the old rivalry, and this time the Magpies prevailed over Carlton. Tell you what, uh, they, they must have been 4,000 punches thrown there by one Carlton player. Bruce still nearly lost his head there. Oh, I do, it could have been Dool doing. But it could 
be another bloke coming in now. This fellow here, look at this. Well, the umpire did take Carmen's number. It's he still is. on again here now. They're still having a go. Another bit of a dust oh, up there. Hello. If you don't mind. Free kick to Carlton. And the free kick will go to it over beautifully to Collins. And Collins is clear. Oh, he's got one in the face. Look at the free kick. The big fella certainly scoots around for free side. North Melbourne had proved too strong during the season and so it proved on preliminary final day at VFL Park. This would be the end of an era. It would be the farewell season for so many greats. For Wayne Richardson after 277 games. For brother Max after 211. Len Thompson after five Copelands and 270 games. Ross Dunn after 213 games. And fabulous Phil Carmen of white boot fame after 66 games. I never had many achievements in footy. I always tried hard. I, I never, you know, every training night I trained as hard as I could and uh, I, played in, I played in our team with a lot of very good players. So I was never a Copeland winner or an interstate representative. Um, and I had, I had, I suppose I played fairly consistently, but I, I never played to me best all the time, which is what everybody loves to do if they could. Ray Shaw would take over the captaincy and among the new players in his charge were Melbourne's Ross Brewer, Carlton and North's Craig Davis, Richmond's Butch Edwards, and kids in Dennis Banks' David Toomey and the incredibly talented Peter Dacos. I think 1979 it was probably the best side I played with. We didn't have a lot of you know, stars, champions, as you probably call it. We were just a team of goers, and that's the way we played footy under Tommy Hafey. The outstanding player of the season was undoubtedly Magpie star Peter Moore. In the Brownlow, he'd win by a vote from Gary Wilson. The name of the game in football is, is to win premierships, and uh, unfortunately we didn't do it in 77, and Collingwood and the Collingwood supporters um, have been waiting for 21 or 22 years mm. for a premiership, and to me, although this is wonderful and I, you know, I'm really honoured to receive it, I think that um, I'll just be forgetting about it and get out on Saturday and try and get best on the ground on Saturday. So once again, it would be Carlton on grand final day. The Magpies' defence stiffened with the return of Magro after suspension. 113,000 saw an even first half. Covered by Young. Jesselenko in there. Gives it almost to Southby. Back to Young. In comes Renee Kink. Used a bit of weight. Down went Young. In goes the weight. Brewer's in there. Young is out cold. But a fair bump, I thought. Careful, Renee. You're gone, son. Swim out there trying to pick it up. Back it goes there to Worthington, he's in trouble, he's grabbed, got a kick out. And we see a chance for pick and grab too high. Oh, down he got with Johnson going in pretty hard for Edwards. He's too good for a duel and a beautiful mark. As the kick by Edwards, looking there for Weirmouth. Oh, he's got one on the back. I think he played for that. Well, we'll wait for this shot now. Weirmouth lining him up. We'll see whether they can get it through. The kick. He's put it right through the middle. 113,000 saw an even first half. Later, it would be the flair of Ronnie Wearmouth as he made the vital move. This was a game that would go down to the wire, when one act would be all that was needed, and so it would be. Harms fires at the goals, but he's off target. That's rolling towards the boundary line, and Harms almost makes ground. He tips it back to Sheldon, and it's a goal! After the recruiting coups of recent years, Hafey could feel bitter about the quality of players added to his list for the 1980 season. Despite this, the club would have mixed results. It would again reach the night grand final under Ray Shaw and look to have won the premiership when it led after the final siren. Unfortunately, the umpires didn't hear that siren. The siren's gone, the crowd coming onto the ground now. Good kicks this goal, they've won the match. He's only about uh, 25 to 30 North Melbourne went on to take the $64,000 first prize from the amazed Magpies. The game won't be replayed, but Mr Hamilton told me the siren fiasco won't happen again. We've had the, uh, the siren tested on previous occasions and uh, we haven't had any problems with it this year at all until last night. Under Hafey, Collingwood continued to be a power in 1980. It would lose twice to Carlton, and the emerging Richmond, 
but won seven of its last eight games, would finish fifth and face the long slog to the grand final. Goes for the short pass, great play by Brewers, he's found Ray Shaw, he'll run into the open goal for the easiest of goals and that was tremendous football by Collingwood. Moore finished fourth in the Brownlow and won the Copeland again and in the elimination final against North ruthlessly disposed of his great rival Dempsey in a best on ground display. Umpire says play and Carson snaps for goal, there he goes again for goal number three. And as this fella turned out to be something at all, look at him there. Up to Moore and Dench again having a great battle, there's Sutton going with a big punch. There's the danger man, Carson a snap for goal, another one. That's goal number. Hafey included young Tony Shaw for his first final in the first semi against Carlton. 94,000 saw Collingwood come from behind after half time to win by 50 points. That could be a miraculous goal! Oh, what brilliant play that was. Dill spins out of the pack, it's a bad hand pass to Kenk, he'll get, try to get out, he's cleared out, back to Wearmouth. Wearmouth going for a run, the hand pass back there to Barham, snaps for goal, and that's another one. Over to Wearmouth, look at the little rover go, he hasn't got a helmet today, out to Barham. Barham runs around, he's a part of Maryland, back to Wearmouth. They've got Carlton Bamboozel, over to Wearmouth, Barber again, a shot for goal. It'll be through, goal, a goal, and they're really giving uh, Carlton a pasting now. That was magnificent play by Barham. A week later, it would be the minor premiers Geelong, and another cutthroat affair. This time the Magpies had to stand united to withstand a withering final quarter burst from Bill Goggin's Cats. They held on by four points. Scooped out towards Tony Shaw, flicks it out towards Dacos again from 20 metres out, that's a goal! Carlson towards right half forward, but only Jan Smith for Geelong is there. Craig Davis, there's the siren, Collingwood are in the grand final! Collingwood has won the preliminary final! Well, the first side to make the grand final since the inception of the final Collingwood had run its race. A tough campaign had left them in no condition to take on the Tigers. On grand final day 1980, Richmond would lead by seven goals at half time and extend that lead to a record 81 point drubbing. And he's put it through for a goal. Here's a go now for Collingwood to score a goal as Wearmouth goes for a long hand pass. Tomori can't miss this one for sure. They were the best side I'd seen, you know, 1980 for the 10 years prior that I'd been playing. And, uh, they were a fantastic side, Richmond, you know. Uh, I can, well, I can't remember touching the ball in that grand final. It was just, but they had the ball on a string. They were a fantastic side. We are the magpies of black and white. Babe. Collingwood and Carlton would both win 17 matches in 1981. A loss to Fitzroy in the final home and away match at Victoria Park, costing the Magpies top spot. A week later, Peter Moore in his first year as captain would take his side into yet another finals campaign under Hafey. Geelong, with John Mossop kicking seven, would relegate Collingwood to the first semi-final. It was not the fortnight Hafey had planned. 14 points up at the last change, the Magpies had to battle desperately for their survival. Billy Picken, the best player in a one-point win. His left foot has a shot for goal, and that's a great goal. Good goal to Peter Dacos. Collingwood looking very good. The punch from the pack. Smith put it down again. Good favour Collingwood here, yes. Picked up by Craig Davis. He tries to get a shot toward goal. It's going through, I would think. Yes, the Collingwood fans say that's a goal to Craig Davis. A nice piece of work from the centre bounds. That got it down, and Davis did the rest. This is the target, he tapped the ball on, didn't try and take it. Barham is the recipient. Barham on the left foot going goalward, that's a beautiful goal! It's a beautiful kick from Davis, right up to the goal square. Fires fly high, it's grabbed up over the shoulder! Curry would have hit the front! A beautiful goal by Russ Brewer! Uh, Bill was, uh, uh, what can you say, a, a funny bloke on the ground. He, we always uh, had a go at Billy for not picking up his own man. We were chasing his man around and things like that, but one of the most spectacular players you wanted to see. With Skipper Moore out injured, the Magpies won through to their third straight grand final as they finished all over Geelong in the preliminary final. Ian Cooper, playing only his fourth game for the season, came in and was best of field. He runs out of bounds. Long kick in towards the goal. Great goal from King. Buffer pass to Mark to Jeffries out there. Is Cooper going to have a goal? Oh. 
Oh, they go in very hard. Cooper M to Jeffrey, but Cooper went after him. Came there as he drives the ball up there, but there's the mark again to Cooper. And he's standing up like the rocket of problem. Cooper's there for Collingwood. Boji, what a nail-biting finish. After Williams got on top in the third, underneath is Cooper. Jaws does it again. What a game it is. Knocked out there by Blake. Uh, Kink fumbles, has a snapshot for goal. He's put it through for an amazing goal. Bob uh, are still yet to win one in the last 23 years. Now, now they'll be flat out to try and drag this one. And we see Peter Moore. Grand final day 1981, another confrontation with Carlton and the Pies' eighth attempt to win a flag since 1958. Pat, uh, Moore won the toss and decided the kick to the right of the screen. Williams coming out of the pack, brilliant play at centre-half. Magnificent play by the ex-South Australian. The back goes for the big punch. Finally picked up by Rene, kick over to Ricky Barron. Goes for a long kick looking for Moore, he's had a shot at goals, it's through! And turned the Tony Shaw. The Magpies are alight. Here's Dacos. Snap for goal coming up. It's on target. Look at that for a goal. Oh, is that for a goal, Robert? Picking it up as Irwin. Gives it to Dacos and turn over to Tony Shaw. Useful handball to Taylor, who uh, skirts well. Shoots at goal and has put it through for a great goal to Taylor. Do it again by Moore. No one can get clear. There's strong play as we see a pick up by Shaw. A snap for goal. It's there. I think he may have put it through a beautiful goal. And the Magpies. The score now. The Magpies in front again by 12 points. Couldn't get clear. Finally, it's picked up. But smothered. There's a go for Williams. Can he pick it up? He's kicked it off the ground. Goal! Oh. Williams' a second goal. What a goal it was. As some rat back threw a piece of paper at him. And Colin would go further ahead. His own. Irwin's after him. He's clear to get a kick now. A long hand pass out to Shelton, who's been a pretty quiet player for Carl today. Finally drives the ball up there, looking for Johnson. He's got the mark. No, he hasn't played it. Finally a tap to Cooper. He loses the ball. There's a go now for uh, Aspen to fire at the goals. And what's he done with it? A goal. So they're coming back, Carl. Long towards half forward. Mackay flies. Aspen scouts well. 12 metres out and goals. Carlton hit the front in the final term. The loss would widen the rift between the players and the coach. Hafey refused to address supporters after the match and let it be known that certain senior players were consistently letting the side down. Once again, a rift between Captain Moore, past Captain Ray Shaw and Coach Hafey would split the club. Couldn't have been a worse year. Everything that's that happened has just been wrong. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, uh, we just can't seem to get a win. We've run sides pretty close without getting a win, you know, which is, you know, terribly needed right now. After eight successive losses in 1982, Hafey was sacked. Into his place would be assistant Mick Irwin. Tommy, unfortunately, was in a situation and we all got together and said, look, Tom, things have got to change. If they don't change, uh, we've got to have a look, hard, serious look at it. Peter Moore, unfortunately, was much maligned over that. Uh, Peter, as the captain, led the way, which is, which is fair and reasonable. Uh, and in the end, I think the committee saved their necks and said, Tommy, you're gone which was possibly the wrong thing to do. We, all we needed was once again the communication, which has been one of the problems of this football club, lack of communication at times. Uh, Mick Irwin stepped in for a short time. That wasn't the answer. The changes would not end there, however. Off the field, yet another challenge to the presidency. This time it would be the new Magpies, led by newspaper publisher Ranald MacDonald. While John Hickey was pushed out, to the board would come former captains Len Thompson and Terry Waters, and businessmen Alan McAllister, Bill Weston and Ian McPherson. And that board of management take control of the club's affairs for the next three years. Uh, we will suspend the constitution and we will make no, uh, the Magpies number one again, both on and off the field. Irwin had no more luck than Hafey as Collingwood lost a record nine games in a row under his leadership. He too would have to go at season's end. Len Thompson was sent to Adelaide to sign the most successful of the modern South Australian coaches, John Cale, a legendary player who in nine seasons with Port Adelaide had won four flags, a magpie to the core. We have played against a lot of VFL clubs, Port Adelaide versus the, you know, Richmond, and we play Essendon, uh, Collingwood. So we feel that we play or did play a similar style to Victoria. Peter Moore wanted to go to Melbourne and was prepared to go to court to win his freedom the new Magpies would fight fire with fire. They spent a fortune recruiting, 
South Australian Greg Phillips, West Australians Gary Shaw and Mike Richardson, from South Shane Morwood and from Richmond David Pope and Jeff Rains. A $2 million shopping spree. Game up there towards Davis with the sit here. Ball hits the deck, Williams gets clear, a snap at goal, it's on the one of the make plays. One casualty was Rene Kink. I was called down the football club at about 4pm uh, to discuss something or rather. I knew it uh, wasn't a ham sandwich, so uh, I was called in and they said that my services were no longer required. What was your immediate feeling? Was it relief or bitterness towards the club? What was it? Look, there was no bitterness or animosity because I've been here a long time, 11 years. Uh, it was a bit of a relief, to be perfectly honest, because uh, after 11 years, uh, maybe I needed a change. In a mixed season, Kale's Magpies would win 12 games and finish sixth. But the football world was more absorbed in the balance sheet and boardroom matters at Victoria Park. By 1984, the debts had risen past $3 million, according to reports in morning papers. There were moments on the field that rallied the huge support base, in front of 70,000 at VFL Park on Anzac Day, they won an epic. He's gone for a pass to Williams. Oh, the got laid out. He's got a booking. That's the dog. That a word. The rally oh. got him on the side of the head, so this could level the scores. It could be a drawn game. What the time to give a decision. Oh, and all the players there. Look at the Collingwood players in the goal square trying to put him off. Can he kick this one to make it a draw? Look at all those Collingwood players. He fails. He's got it, I think. He's missed it. One the goal. goal. Calling it a run the goal. No five points. What a finish. What a finish to this great game. The big there were shocking moments on the field. The day at the Western Oval in round 10, when they had victory in the bag. Collingwood may have thrown this one away as Beasley now from directly in front puts the goals in front. David Cloak was in fine form and would finish runner-up to Peter Moore of all people in the Brownlow. And Tony Shaw would emulate brother Ray by winning the Copeland. After Richardson, another long Collingwood would finish fourth and in the first Sunday final defeated Fitzroy at the MCG by 46 points. Will get there first. Turns around, can he make it two? He's already kicked one, that's a great goal. Still in play, McMuffin sharks it, has a snapshot of goal, that's the sealer for mine. A week later in the first semi-final, Dacos would engineer a 25-point win over Carlton. He'd kick seven. Down to half forward, Collingwood running, Neville Shaw, no one within ten metres, chips it up to full forward. Dacos is there, can he make it six? Gets around Reed, shoots, it's coming round, it's there, I think, for mine. The preliminary final would be Kale's last game, and it was not one he'll remember fondly. The 133-point loss to eventual Premier's Essendon, the worst in a preliminary final. Again, Collingwood would look to Bobby Rose. The new Magpies came into power not long after that, and what they did they overspent, there's no doubt about that. They were inexperienced in how to run a football club. They are almost uh, all business people. But they decided that they would go out and buy a team. Now, you can't do that. But uh, they, were, they started something that really developed from then when we were able to go out, the coach was able to go out and, uh, and select players that he wanted. In 1985, he would add Brian Taylor to his team the former Tiger relished the chance and kicked 80 goals in his first season. When the Magpies finished seventh, Rose too was under pressure. The feeling was that he was warming the seat for his assistant, the former Hawthorne legend, Lee Matthews. After a third round trouncing by North, Rose announced his resignation in April 1986. His replacement, Lee Matthews. I'm facing facts, I'm coach of the senior side and we haven't, haven't won a game and that's just as not good and I, personally I can't accept that. It would be the end too for Ranald McDonald, he left the club in dire financial straits. Into the presidential seat would come former treasurer Alan McAllister. I obviously didn't expect to be senior coach here until, until next year but uh, you can't always decide the circumstances under which a job is taken and uh, 
I was asked to take over and I was only too happy and enthusiastic to do it. Matthews had a massive job ahead of him. He attacked it with the same intensity that marked him as the greatest player the game had seen. This is where it's hard. This is when your legs ache, and however you're feeling, they're aching just as much. Yeah, yeah, well, they're wondering, can we pick them up? Brian Taylor would kick 100 goals in 1986, the fourth magpie after Coventry, Todd and McKenna to reach the tonne. Matthews would restore some pride, but a sixth placing in 1986 and twelfth a year later under a new captain in Tony Shaw was not what he had in mind. Ray Gate had captain, so that was one of my aims, and uh, I thought it was a chance. You know, I thought probably David Cloak had come to the club and had been captain of Richmond, and uh, you know, I thought, well, could have been out of the two of us. You know, there's no use lying about it. And uh, when I got it, I was you know, really wrapped. It. Oh, I didn't. I went up to Lee and I said, uh, you know, what's, what do you want me to do with it? And uh, he said, just, you've got the captaincy because the way you play, you know, we don't want anything to change, which it just relaxed me that much after knowing that, that I didn't have to do anything different. I think, no doubt, the direction of the club changed once Lee got there. I, just little things like our training, well, it's not a little thing, but our training picked up and I would have to say it had improved probably 60 or 70 per cent on what it was. If two players typified the Matthews ideal, they were Darren Mullane, the incredibly tough wingman who, like the lethal Lee of old, could bust a game apart. And Peter Dacos, the genius, who, like Matthews, could manufacture a goal when it was most needed. Perovic got one hand to it. Oh, Dacos, here's a chance for a score. Mr Magic shoots it, go, I think it's there. First goal of the Magpies. In the bad days of 87, Mullane would shine and win a Copeland Trophy. Well done, son. Beautiful passage of play, and he's put it through for a goal. I think he had an aura about him where uh, he sort of dominated an opposition player. Um, I've seen a lot of blokes not play very close to him, um, but he just, you know, had that thing. He was uh, very confident in his own ability. Um, matter of fact, he was, he was very rude in the way that he went about playing against opposition players. It was just that he he felt that he didn't have to uh, lower himself in any way to play against them, and he just wanted to dominate them, which. Um, I, I just, he had that arrogance about him which a lot of great players have had. In 1988, as the Magpies again reached the finals, it was Dacos who would be Collingwood's club champion. That year, Collingwood finished second, but bowed out in miserable circumstances, losing in successive weeks to Carlton and Melbourne. It would be Melbourne in 1989 who would again end the Magpies' dream in the elimination final. Gavin Brown capping a superb year with the Copeland. 1990 had to be the year. It would start terribly in Perth with a loss to the Eagles and the suspension of new boy Tony Francis after this indiscretion on the boundary line. The next week, the season proper got away in many Collingwood fans' eyes. Carlton were thumped, Dacos at his best. Tapped the ground, tucked them! An open goal. Beautiful hand pass to Dacos. Goal number six coming up for Dacos. He's put it through, I feel. Yes, he has. Francisco got a fist to it. Brown still running. Oh, look at this boy go. The claim by Alma. Dacos to right. Is this another one? I think he's kicked it. Alvin, Tudnam, the race is on. Tudnam uses the body nicely. Tries to spoon it out to Banks. Caught by Hannah and Alvin. Tudnam again on to Manson. The big man's clear. He shoots. And he has kicked a miraculous goal. He'll do something magical. Yes, out to the right, hook it back. Has he put it through? Yes, it's a goal to the Magpies. As it's tapped on beautifully, Gavin Brown's been great when the pressure's been applied. He goes short to half forward. It's fisted the ground. Banks off the ground. He's enjoyed Silvani being moved off him as he kicks it up to Dacos. Dacos against Tom Elvin. Dacos onto the left foot. Is this a miraculous goal? A brilliant effort by Dacos. Goal number seven. The Pies were certainly more vigorous. Craig Kelly out for two weeks for whacking Mark Bays. There would be thrillers. None more so than the one-point win over St Kilda at the MCG in round five. 30 metres out. He steadies. Shoots. He goes. The Magpies would be on the other end in round seven when they lost to the Hawks by two points. He's done it again. 
But then came the run, a streak of nine straight wins that showed the men of Collingwood at their very best. Great play! There he is, adding one more stat. McEwen at the back. Oh, gee, nearly gets up, kicks a goal and puts it through. Great effort from McEwen. Scott Russell from centre wing, kicks long. Inside 50, McEwen comes out. He used it that large body of his. Hocking had the ball and then lost it just as quickly. Morgan, a hurried hand pass. Bowen bounces once, twice. Won't get that. Dacos snaps. Steps truly for a goal. Bauer, not a good kick. Mullane with a chance. Still Mullane with power and precision. And has he put it through? Yes. Losing a bit more. Mullane outside 50. Cornered by Eugle. Gets around Eugle and Wilson. Mullane for goal. A sensational kick. Russell from forward of centre. Kicks it to within 35 metres. Collingwood again swoop on it. McGuan. Beautiful kick by McGuan. Again, Collingwood would finish second. Against the Eagles at Waverley, Dacos would kick the goal of the year. Collingwood lifting. Ground right on the boundary line. Back to Mullane, likewise. Dacos nearly runs out of room. Oh. He's goal! Magnificent goal. Peter Dacos, the champ, 13-12 to 12-10. I could sort of see it evolving that, that the ball was going to end up, no doubt, over the heads. And uh, Guy McKenna sort of made a, a half... It, you know, half a lunge at, at Rowdy, went around him, so it was really basically Johnny Worsfold. Ball went over his head, and uh, I remember getting it, and, and sort of, I was in the pocket, so there wasn't a lot, I couldn't really centre it. I was only about 15 yards out, so there, there wasn't a lot. I didn't really have the time to have a look anyway, and uh, I decided to have a shot, and, and a lot of people said to me, because I was on the wrong side, they, they've said, why did you kick it with your right foot? Well, I kicked it with my right foot because it opens up the angle. Had I kicked on the left foot, I would have been right on the boundary. But kicking it with my right foot, it gives me that extra two, three feet and, um, you know, opens up the goals a little bit. It might sound a bit strange, but I knew I had to get the ball as close to the line to bounce in. Not so fortunate was Peter Sumic. His miss would leave scores level. Ticking down. He's in the wrong pocket. This could be a kick after the siren job. He'll take his time. The umpire's called time on here too, Dennis. Yes, has. So the clock is frozen. Peter Sumich. It's a tie. The Magpies won the qualifying final replay a week later and massacred Essendon in the second semi-final. Kicking from outside 50. It is a magnificent kick. After we'd won that first, or oh, that second final, the replay of that final at uh, Waverley, and I knew that we'd, we'd win the, the grand final. I was really before the final, I can't remember any of it. Really, the whole lead up to it, the, the probably parades, the last thing I really remember. I mean, that's why I'd love to have done it again, just to understand and soak it in more. Fans swarmed into Victoria Park for the final training session of 1990. It was like a match day, such was the feeling of excitement and anticipation. Vendors were doing a roaring trade, while the fight for anything black and white regardless of the price, was like the fight for the very sustenance of life. Young boys born more than a quarter of a century after Collingwood's last win and nurtured in the Collingwood tradition were there to see their heroes. While some of the most respected members of Melbourne's community, like criminal lawyer and former player Frank Galbally, was deeply touched by the occasion. It's magnificent to be here because you see the mystique of Collingwood and their supporters here now. This can never happen to any other club and has never happened. We are unique and I think we'll make it. Lee Matthews, hooted for years as a Hawthorne player who often dashed the hopes of the Collingwood fans, was given special hero worship as he walked stony-faced onto the ground. Oh, I uh, feel quite confident about the game, Eddie, but again, uh, it depends on uh, us performing at our peak. I think this is the best team that I've seen uh, for quite, probably since 1970. To the eve of the match, and a dozen players felt up to facing the crowds again, this time in the grand final parade. Their bus greeted along the roadway with well wishes. 
The players were then greeted with an unprecedented crowd as they made their way down Burke Street in the heart of Melbourne, cheered all the way by their adoring fans. We're really looking forward to the clash. It should be a great day. Hopefully the weather will be like this. It'll be a great event. Uh, the centre bounce caps everything off. You know, uh, It's a good spectacle for the spectators, but you know, we're out there to play football, so I'm looking forward to the centre bounce. Well, we're sort of hoping we can do it. You know, We'll put everything in and uh, see how it goes. Been in these a few times before as a player. Does it feel a bit different as a coach? Um, oh, yes. Well, you know, physically you're not going to put yourself on the line tomorrow, so it's a gigantic difference there. A beautiful Melbourne spring day, only blustery wind taking away from ideal conditions. The two teams hit the ground, no change in the Essendon lineup. Collingwood brought Shane Kerrison in for the injured Alan Richardson. Salmon. At the six and a half minute mark of the first quarter, Hamilton for Essendon kicked long and high, and Paul Salmon, the man Collingwood supporters feared the most, marked and kicked the first for the game. Essendon one goal, Collingwood two behinds. Ten minutes later and Essendon's second goal was on the board. Again, Salmon on the end of a Chris Danaher pass. The Bombers two goals in front and Collingwood supporters starting to worry. They know their team plays better after getting off to a strong start. Salmon punts for goal. He's happy. It's there. Collingwood just needed an icebreaker. And 21 and a half minutes in, it came in the form of a Peter Dacos miracle. Look at the gather. The right foot snap. This is a... It was Dacos's 96 for the year, but a more important goal the great man has never kicked. Then, just before quarter time, full forward Gavin Brown, using his brilliant pace and agility, turned a tight angle into an open goal, and Collingwood led by three points. With the quarter time siren came what many believe was the turning point of the game. A scuffle involving Magpies' Dennis Banks and Craig Kelly developed with Essendon's Kieran Spawn. Brown rushed in to lend support. Suddenly, Terry Danaher hit Brown, and it was on with everyone included. And when I say everyone, I mean it. Players, officials, trainers, and even Channel 7 commentator Bernie Quinlan was mixed up in the action. There's probably three or four pockets that have now almost dissolved into one. Players are being thrown everywhere. Oh, look at this. It's funny because a lot of people say it was your own fault you got knocked out because you, uh, you ran down to... Uh, to the incident, but uh, gee, if I hadn't, I think I would have been the only one standing in the huddle talking to Lee at uh, quarter time. So, but no, yeah, it was a bit of a um, bit of a blue started down there at the end of the, of the quarter, and uh, uh, you know it, it all got pretty fiery, and uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up sort of, you know, um, lying down on the ground for a while. But I, look, I was I, people say, do you remember uh, much of the game? That, but uh, I probably only don't remember the second and third quarters. As Starcevich exited, Gavin Brown KO'd himself at the end of the first quarter came on to the roar of the crowd. He ran straight at Terry Danaher and chested him. His action showed that Collingwood could take the best the Bombers could give and come back and give some more. It was one of the most memorable moments of this game. The hunger after 32 years of starvation was insatiable. Dacos only kicked two goals for the day, but both were gems. His second came from nearly out of the realms of probability. Then, at the 25-minute mark, supreme pressure saw the ball flip into the hands of Brown and his comeback was complete when he split the middle of the goals. Turn is caught, but he gets his foot to the ball and kicks it to the front of the square. Oh, nearly Brown. Eston under pressure. Brown will kick a goal. And if that doesn't bring the roof off the MCG, nothing will. At three-quarter time, Collingwood led 11-10-76 to 5-6-36. It's the last address that Matthews would give for the year. Collingwood has set up the win. Now all they have to do is maintain their composure and fight like hell for 30 more minutes. Breaks At the 19 the minute in. mark, Doug Barwick snapped a goal and a burden carried by all Collingwood fans for 32 years is starting to lift. A rumble builds into a roar and good old Collingwood forever is being heard throughout Australia. But nothing like the centre of the world at that moment, the Melbourne cricket ground. Big Damien Monkhorst, who had played so well, closed the chapter on Australian sports most celebrated and talked about losing run. Lee Matthews, the stoic coach, decided it was time to be on the ground. He'd dominated as a player. His show of jubilation, one of the great moments captured on this field of sporting memories.
And finally, the ball in the hand of Darren Mullane, his thumb held together since round 21 by tape. As the siren sounds, the Magpies are premiers. Here it is, the presentation by Dr John Hamilton. Yeah, you play a long time, but uh, 13 years it's all been worth it, mate. I just can't believe it. That's what it's all about. I mean, we've kept our head down all year, and uh, and this is what's eventuated. And I mean, it's good luck to the boys that take it in now. I mean, it's an unbelievable feeling. It's one of the best efforts of all time. We just put everything in. It's just brownie and sure and uh, fantastic. Oh, yeah, you know, we've been put a lot of hard work in, and, uh, no, it's paid off now, so thanks for us for that. Oh, fantastic. I just uh, can't think of times when it's happening. And I just said to Wayne Richardson, this is really happening, isn't it? For the first time since 1959, a premiership pennant would be unfurled. But the 1991 season would be highly disappointing to Matthews and his men. Ford cut it off, Turner short, Kelly, Wine, Francis should go. He really should kick this. Drop Panic through the front. There were standout performances again, like Peter sure. Dacos and his eight and goals against Francis. St Kilda at VFL Park. Good foot. Kicks long up towards full forward. Oh, the mark fumbled down there by Rice. Dacos off the ground, gets goal number five. Keeping the forward line open. Dacos will be there about, there he is, gets away from Spud Frawley, kicks a goal, looks like number eight, the goal umpire says, yes sir. One year exactly after the joyous Sunday celebrations at Victoria Park, in a dark cold street in Albert Park, the life of Darren Mullane ended. After travelling to the country for a wedding, Mullane had decided to party on at the tunnel. He phoned his great mate Dennis Banks, but Banks was not home. Normally, Darren would not go near a car after he'd been drinking. On this occasion, he'd had too much. His judgment was not there, and after falling asleep at the wheel, Mullane clipped the back of a truck and rolled his car. An accident uh, that takes someone's life's a shock, no matter what. But, uh, but Darren was one of those people who was so full of life, I think it is still very hard for people to imagine him not there. I, I think many people that know him well still almost expect him to walk in the door. You know, it's, he's one of, he, because he was so full of life, even harder to imagine someone like that gone. And uh, I think that, that made the shock even greater for most, uh, most people who knew him well. At his funeral at the Dandenong Town Hall, people began assembling at 5 a.m. It was one of the biggest ever seen in Melbourne. His fans, his family, his teammates and friends all joined to say goodbye. As his teammates formed the guard of honour, and with the strains of the club theme song in the background, the crowd could not help but acknowledge their champ one more time. Mullane's untimely death may well have spurred the Magpies out of their premiership lethargy. After missing the finals in 91, they were back in contention the next year. Collingwood wanting goals badly. Dacos lets go with a torpedo punt. It's a magnificent kick! For hard man Craig Kelly, five weeks would be spent on the sidelines after this incident against the Swans. The fireworks lit up the skies over the Melbourne cricket ground. More than 80,000 turned up on a Thursday night in May to celebrate a unique centenary. 100 years after Collingwood played its first match against Carlton, the two sides met again. The fiercest rivals in league history put on a fairly tame show. As has happened so often in the past, it was Carlton's turn. Here's Spalding. He's still getting around the Collingwood players. Earl Spalding by 40 metres. What a great goal! Tony Shaw and Magpie assistant coach-to-be, Danny Frawley, got the elimination final off to a frenetic start. The Magpies, with 16 wins, had been equal ladder leaders, but this day would be eliminated in one. Such was the final system of 1992. Russell Dodgers from 50, goes long and kicks a goal. 
To the club in 1992 would come Saverio Rocca. He would head the goal kicking in 1993 and was a nomination for the Norwich Rising Star. The Collingwood sharpshooter Saverio Rocca was the judge's nomination for the Norwich Rising Star Award after round 14. Collingwood full forward Saverio Rocca is going places. He played his first senior game in 1992, just three years after taking up Aussie rules. Running onto the ground you get all these goosebumps and you get really nervous and sometimes you even feel like throwing up once or twice and before the game but once you get out there the crowd's really roaring and they get right behind you and I think that's what makes it play really well. Peter Dacos continued to kick goals. In 1993, when many thought him finished, he came up with eight against Geelong. He goes out wide. Oh, Richardson, who had a brilliant third quarter. With close to ten possessions in that term. Down to Dacos, who's kicked five. And he might make it six now from the boundary line. Loves them from there and gets a miraculous goal. By the start of the next year, coach Matthews had decided his time was up. At the MCG, Dacos would bid an emotional farewell. What a day too. Mick McGuan with one of the goals of the century. And McGuan gets past Brown. They're lifting the pies. They can sense it. First 15 minutes ordinary, but since then they've been good. McGuan's had five bounces. Nearly get another one. Round he goes. In he goes to an open goal. Every time I cross the line, I try to give. Um, and the most important challenge I think any player's got in their makeup is to become a consistent performer. Merely because I think there's no point going out last week and getting your 40 touches, and then seven days later you go out and get your five. The player himself has got to really minimise the area between top and bottom performance. As Dacos bowed out, another champion was making his mark. From Brisbane came the most heralded player of the decade, Nathan Buckley. Superbly skilled and a polished big game performer, Buckley would be a match winner for years to come. Kicks for goal. I think it's good, it is. Collingwood in front. There were facilities put, put in place that if I wanted to leave that I could to the club of my choice. Uh, at the end of that year, uh, we had a look around and basically um, the desire I had to play for Collingwood 12 months earlier still existed and I was happy to go and I wanted to come to Melbourne. Um, so the deal was done. Tony Shaw would play on, ready to move past 300, but he did relinquish the captaincy to Gavin Brown. I dreamt of playing for the club to start with and uh, I don't think I would have ever dreamt of being captain, but uh, you know, to, to be captain is just a, you know, it's a real bonus, and, uh, you know, especially with a club like Collingwood. Strength, speed, endurance, uh, skill. Uh, you know, one of the most important things he has got is a real desire to win. Uh, I, I think the reality of our game shows that irrespective after a contest there's a winner and a loser. And you can just see when you look into the eyes and the hatred that is paramount when we do lose, I think it does spur him on to, you know, a, an added drive the next time we compete. And Brownie being the competitor that he is, I think he looks forward to that situation. Handball over the top. Opportunity Richardson, unselfishly to Russell. Russell up to the goal square, Brown marks. By round 16, Shaw had equaled Gordon Coventry's club record of 306 games. He missed the next week, but against the Bulldogs made the mark all his. Strangely, the great full forward and the pugnacious rover are Collingwood's only triple centurions. Well, I guess the first thing that springs to mind when, when I think of Shaw is just, um, just a single-minded uh, determination to uh, just to get the job done. Uh, it probably the most uh, mentally tough competitor I guess I've ever come across. Collingwood won a place in the New Look final eight on percentage in 1994 and did a mighty job losing to the Eagles by two points in Perth. Shaw's farewell game overshadowed by a spiteful send-off. In 1995 Severio Rocker would kick 93 goals None more important than this one against Essendon in front of 95,000 on Anzac Day. The kick by Brent Ball. There's the Unbelievable. The season's first try. 
When he won the 1990 Premiership, Lee Matthews was anointed coach for life. At the end of 1995, his coaching life at Victoria Park had come to an end. Tony Shaw would be the obvious replacement. 1996 was a year of celebration, of fireworks and backslapping. It was the year the AFL lit 100 candles and enjoyed a centenary season. Just as they'd done 100 years earlier, Collingwood played St Kilda. But unlike that first game, St Kilda won this time. Richardson tried to push it wider. Taken away by Sharkey over the top to Curran. Now here's a chance from 50 metres. Nathan Buckley goes bang! One would suggest that he fancies his chances. No, he sees out of the corner of his eye the opportunity to kick to the front of the goals. Buckley, can he get his fourth? He is so skillful off both sides. That is a magnificent kick. Four goals to Nathan Buckley. The AFL would name a team of the century. Amazingly, not one Collingwood player was deemed good enough. In the Hall of Fame, however, the Coventrys and Colliers, Jack Regan, Dick Lee, Charlie Panham, Dan Minogue, Fonce Kine, Lou Richards, Bob Rose, and Jack Hamilton, the AFL administrator, would be inductees. In the years ahead, Peter Dacos and Len Thompson would be added, while Gordon Coventry would be elevated to legend status. The late 90s would again see the Magpies slide. Under Shaw, the team would slip down the ladder until in 1999 they were again vying for the dreaded wooden spoon. Poor administration had plagued the club in every decade for half a century. A new look was needed, a new and vibrant leader. And television personality and sporting journalist Eddie Maguire was just the man. Ladies and gentlemen, Today is a hugely emotional day, but not one of sadness. We say goodbye to Jock McHale Stadium at Victoria Park and look back on great memories and victories and battles, the hard times we've endured and that indomitable Collingwood spirit that has always prevailed. Victoria Park had been used sparingly in the 90s. Finally, the great ground would be farewelled in round 22 of the 1999 season. Tony Shaw had publicly stated this would be his last game as coach, and the faithful turned up at the renamed McHale Stadium in their droves. You know, this club was built on a, a work ethic which, you know, has been the greatest at AFL level for a long period of time. You know, the thing is that the whole ethos of the group and, and the club has been built on integrity, on honesty, and a work ethic, like I said, which has been unmatched before. Victoria Park itself, in the history of Victoria Park, has meant that people, young athletes like yourself, thousands of them, have only had ambitions to represent Collingwood. And to me today, it's an opportunity for us to do that at the highest level again. The Maguire team went to the top of the list when they sought Shaw's replacement. To the club would come a dual premiership coach. Under Skipper Buckley and Coach Malthouse, the revival would start in earnest. People come back to Collingwood it's in the blood. You only need to turn up at a past players function to see players who have left in acrimony over the years all return to Collingwood because this is home. To be a Collingwood man or woman is to be part of a unique sporting club. It's right here in the heart. It's why we fill the MCG every time we take on our most bitter rivals. It's born into you and you take it to the grave. Black and white when it's over. Now we want it, we'll be Good old Collingwood forever We know how to play the game Side by side we stick together